What is up everybody? I am Jeff from Timmoots Design and in today's video we're going to walk you through the setup of the Onefinity Journeyman along with what bench we used and setting up that waste board. I'll also kind of do a Q&A at the end just to answer some general questions I kind of get on Instagram. And then there will also be a part two of this video which will be setting up a spindle along with cable management. So stick around and I think you'll like what we got for you. So obviously we have to start with the bench. We went with one of these Craig benches. These are great. This is our third one and I highly recommend them. I actually have a video on setting these up if you're interested, but for now we're just gonna skip all that and hop right into making work for the CNC. Probably wondering who the heck is that? That's not Jess. Well, this is Evie. Evie helps us out a few times a week, so we'll probably be seeing her around here a lot more. So in order to make this bench work, we added some supports to the middle based on recommendations from others, just because you don't want any sag in the middle with the plywood. So we used these two two by fours that I just had laying around and I just cut them to width so they would slide in this groove. Also, you need to make note that we have to cut a little lip out here just so they sit flush with the top of the metal of like the channel. So I just kind of cut this with the handsaw then just chiseled it back until it fit in there flush. And then I just kind of took a straight edge and just checked to make sure it was as level as possible. I mean, it doesn't need to be perfect as we're going to surface our wasteboard anyway, but just get it as close as you can. And then once we got that done, we're going to go ahead and just attach this piece of plywood, which measures 68 by 48. So if you're like us and you already have the Onefinity and you just got the Journeyman upgrade, you're going to have to take the machine apart and essentially just put it back together. And this is us just doing exactly that. Just take out all the Allen bolts, pull everything apart that you can. We actually sent back this top rail to Onefinity as we no longer need it, and it didn't fit our beta machine. Then I wanted a space to attach stuff, so we just used the off cut from this piece of plywood to kind of close this part off. We actually ended up doing both sides later, but here you just show us attaching to one. And then we roughly measured the distance between the rails and attached the top rail. So I'm kind of just snugging these all down so nothing can move. I'm not putting them super tight right now. I'll kind of do that all later once everything's kind of locked in place. Same thing with the spindle, I'll get this close, and once we get the wasteboard on it, I'll adjust it till it's square. So we actually end up messing up here, but for the sake of the video, we'll just keep it rolling. So we lock down one side as you normally would. I mean, we actually just put one screw in per corner, and I haven't had any issues like this, but you should probably just do all four. And then we went ahead and mounted the controller to the outside of this board we added earlier, which I'll also attach the spindle VFD later, but for now, we're not gonna show any of that. Onefinity did offer longer cables, but they didn't offer a longer X cable, which would have been nice, as you'll see why shortly. And this was the issue. I just didn't think about how long the cables were, so before you set up your machine, just make sure the cables are long enough for where you want them to go. So now we're back on track. We just slid the machine over a little bit, put the controller on the inside of the bench, and there was more than enough length on the cable. I wish they would just add an extra foot or so, just because I'd rather have extra cable than not enough cable, but not that big a deal. We got to figure it figured out. So. And now that I think of it, it's actually nice to have this box on the inside, make sure that e-stop is accessible, but having it on the outside, I've actually bumped it a few times with my butt or just like a broom or something, and it's quite annoying. It's not like it's something that would happen often, but just something to keep in mind. Also, if you're running drag trains, make sure the drag chains will fit on the table where you plan on putting them. And then we're going to go ahead and lock in one side. This one side will be mounted completely down, and then we'll lock in the other side shortly. And again, this is just a 5 8 spade bit. I just didn't want the cables out and open to possibly catch on something or anything like that. So the cable is plenty enough length now. I just drilled a few holes through the 2x4 just to hold it up, and then I added one staple to the outside. You just pop off this plate, and it kind of locks in that router cable so it doesn't get in the way. And then just home your machine. Again, the right side is not locked in yet, but you need to power this thing up and make sure it runs. And now that the machine is all the way forward, I went ahead and locked in the front other side. And then we're going to move this thing all the way back and lock in that other side to make sure everything's nice and parallel. And right here is where I would go around and add the rest of the mounting screws. So now we just use the gaming controller to slide the machine all the way to the right just to make sure the limits were set. And in this case, they weren't. So we had to hop into the settings and change a few things just to let the machine know how far to go. So I reached out to Onefinity and they walked me through this. I'm sure they have a form right up somewhere, but you hop over, hop into motor zero and then copy these numbers into travel per rev, and then hop down here to max soft limit, and this will set your Y axis limits. So now that your machine is set up, everything homes correctly, and all your limits are set, we're gonna go ahead and start working on the wasteboard. So now just take a small bit, any small bit will work, because this doesn't need to be exact. I just use a 90 degree V bit, and I just mark the max reach of each corner, and then I just trace the line all the way around, so I would know the max cut area of the machine. 
And then I kind of just laid everything out to kind of figure out what I wanted to do here. And then I went and got Jess and we kind of talked about it and we decided to go with less T-Tracks since we kind of glue a lot of things down or use jigs. And to mount these down, we're gonna use size eight screws, three quarter inch. And then I just use this centering bit because I don't want anything to kind of veer off track. And then I just attach the T-Tracks right on the outside of the line we drew earlier. One screw in the middle and one on each end. We'll add the rest later. And then for the layout of the middle three tracks, I just marked a line right in the middle of these two tracks. And then I just centered the other two accordingly. I then added those marks on the opposite side and then just used a straight edge to draw that line straight across and I aligned the T-track holes right on those lines. Same process as before. Pre-drill the holes and just add half the screws. And now for the wasteboard itself, I ended up buying one full sheet of 3 quarter inch MDF because it was essentially the same price as a half sheet. And then just go ahead and cut that to your desired measurements. So now I'm just setting up my joiner to add a rabbit or like a groove to accept the T-Track. I'll show you why in a little bit, but there's a ton of different ways to do this. You could just use a router bit, you could use your table saw, or if you have a fancy joiner that has this feature, it works great. I actually saw someone in the Onefinity group on Facebook do this, and I thought that was a super cool idea because it actually helps hold the T-Track down as well. So then I went ahead and added my pieces. My two outside pieces were 12 inches as they overlap the T-Track and my two inside pieces were about 11 and 5 eighths. And as you can see, as you screw these down, it's actually gonna hold that T-Track down nice and tight so none of them screws strip out. And now that I'm sure everything lines up like it's supposed to, I went back in and added the rest of these number eight screws to hold everything down nice and tight. So I'm probably gonna add a T-Track to the front here. I don't know exactly where I want it yet, so we're just gonna decide that later. But I just took this countersink bit about a quarter inch down because we are gonna have to surface this and I probably will surface this again in the future. So make sure them screws are far enough down to where they won't get hit, probably at the same level as where the T-Track is. So then I just went around and added screws, just regular inch and a quarter drywall screws, nothing special. And then I did have to add a little longer hose just because the journeyman does have a little extra length to it. So that was a quick fix. And then I just attached that so we can get this wasteboard surfaced. So now we're gonna move the machine back to the home position. And then they do make surfacing bits for this, which are like an inch and a quarter or something, but I don't have one. So I'm just gonna use this three quarter inch bit and it worked just fine. It'll just take a little longer. So let's hook that up, set your zero and start cutting. I believe this took about 30 minutes. I will offer a cut file for this along with the grid, which you will see shortly. So make sure you check our website for that. And I actually cut down 0.05, which seemed like a lot at first, but check this out. Once it got to the back, it was dang near almost flush. So this is why you surface it, just so either you take out all inconsistencies. If you don't, it'll be quite noticeable, especially when you're cutting large carves. And then my bit didn't go all the way to the back as this isn't an actual cut area. So I just used a hand plane to kind of clean that up. So now that your machine's all set up, you could go ahead and trim the machine now if you want to. I, uh, this is the third machine I've set up and I haven't really had any issues. I also don't do anything crazy advanced. If you need it to be super accurate or doing a bunch of advanced 3D carbs, then maybe spend some more time on tramming. But for me, just the basic squaring the Z slider and everything at setup is plenty for what I do. And then I like a grid. It just makes lining everything up a lot easier. And that is pretty much it. Your machine's pretty much set up and good to go. I'll have a cut sequence montage up here just to kind of show us using the machine and how we kind of clamp stuff down. And then following that, I'll have a quick Q&A of questions I got on Instagram. So if you have questions, let them know below. And I can also answer those in the next video. I'll also do a video on clamping stuff down and multiple ways to hold stuff down. Um, but for most of the small stuff we do, I just use this double-sided tape method. I use CA glue and masking tape, but it's the same concept. But there's a lot of ways to do this. And this is the main reason why we didn't use more T-Track, but you have to customize everything to your needs. It's also not that hard to change up. It wouldn't take you very long. I'm also going to make a bunch of jigs. We use some jigs, but I would like to make a lot more because they make mounting stuff and repeatability a lot easier. So that'll be a part of the video I mentioned earlier. But right here, just basic T-Track, and then we just use these scrap pieces of wood with little T-Track hold downs, and they work great. Same here. It usually doesn't take much pressure, especially for V-carving. All right, guys, I got, a, I got a list of notes here. I'm just going to run through some of these. I don't want to make this video too long, so I'll just kind of stick to the more popular, easier to answer questions. So vacuum and dust boot. What vacuum and dust boot am I running? I'm running the original, or like the dust boot that comes with the Onefinity. Um, it's the Suck It dust boot. 
I've tried multiple options on dust collection. I would say for mo most people, just a regular shop bag would be fine, but get one of them bags that go over the filter because that fine dust clogs up that filter real quick and you lose a ton of suction. I'm currently running a ShopFox W1826. I'm not sure. It is a one horsepower system and yeah. So the one horsepower shop box, I'm just kind of trying this system out just because I was sick of the vacuum on the floor. This mounts to the wall, it's a nice setup. Um, it works okay. For most things, it's fine. For heavy material removal, it just doesn't have enough oomph and you still get a lot of overspill. Rockler does make a larger version of that, which I might look into, but it's like 600 bucks, so I'm not really sure the route I want to go. There's also like Festool systems and Fiend and I think Metabo makes one. Um, those are great, they work really well, they're really quiet, but they're expensive and the bags cost a lot that you need to replace on a regular basis. So for most people, again, I would just use a shop bag for starting out and that's plenty fine. I do plan on doing a video kind of going through each one and like the pros and cons of all of them, but I'm still currently testing them out myself and seeing what I like the best. So hopefully soon in the near future, I'll make that video to hopefully make the decision of purchasing easier on you because I've went through the entire process. All right, the monitor. Should you buy the larger monitor for the Winfinity? Um, that's a tough question to answer because I personally don't like the monitor. Jess likes the monitor, so it's 100% personal preference. Um, if I were to buy and use the monitor, I would get the larger one. I always have Wi-Fi, I always have my laptop, and for me, it's just far easier to do that, use the little mouse pad versus poking that small screen. Again, personal preference, if I were to buy it, I'd spend the extra and get the larger screen, but for some people with granted budget, it'll do just fine. Like I said before, Jess uses it. She prefers that because she don't have to go to her laptop. So uh, pick whatever side you want. Size of the bench, size of the footprint of the journeyman. I'll show you that with like an overlay. So the footprint of the machine, just the machine, is 60 inches. From the outside of each rail to the outside of these feet is 60 inches. 42 and a half to the outside of each of these feet. If you include the motor, it's just under 45. And then again, my table is 48 by 68. If you want the controller next to the machine, the controller is about seven inches wide. Um, it stands about 17 inches tall to the top of the spindle motor with just the regular Makita router. I think that's it for sizing. Um, it cuts 32 and a quarter by 48. And I think that's it. Software. Does the Onefinity come with software? Not really. It has a post processor that you upload files to, but there's a ton of different software out there. We still use Easel. Easel's great. Vetrix, amazing. A ton of people use Vetric, it's expensive, so I would maybe start with the Easel uh, X-Carve software or the Shapeoko software, them are both free. Uh, CarveCo, that's another one that's relatively affordable that has the 3D offerings that Easel and the Shapeoko don't. So I would start with the free softwares, Easel or Carbide Create or whatever the Shapeoko one is and go from there and then work your way up to Vetric or maybe even CarveCo. Total cost of the machine, how much does the machine cost? So if you don't know anything about CNC, you don't have anything, it's gonna cost you like $3,500 because you gotta buy the machine, that's about $2,500. If you get the journeyman, that's gonna be even more. So by the time you buy a bench, figure out what software you wanna use, some sort of dust collection, and then at least a laptop to run your software. You could probably do it on an iPad. I sure wouldn't want to, but Again, personal preference. So I would say at least $3,500 to get this thing up and running to your door. All right, what else do we got here? Is the machine plug and play? I honestly hate that question just because so many people assume that you just plug this thing in and it'll carve whatever you want. That is not the case. Sure, you can get this machine and if you know nothing, you can probably have it up and running in an hour. I had it together in like 15, 20 minutes, but I've done this a few times. Um, is it plug and play? Uh, setting up the machine, sure, plug and play. Learning the software, learning several softwares, because I'll make my own files and I use uh, Adobe products to kind of make files and do all that kind of stuff. And then you gotta program the files, so even if you use Easel, 
I would highly recommend jumping in Easel or Carbide Create and spending hours in there just learning the software because it's gonna be at least a six month learning curve to get you to the point where you're proficient and comfortable with the machine. You have to learn the software, learn all the bits, learn the speeds. So there's just, it's gonna be a journey and you should expect it to be a journey. Um, if you're not willing to learn all that, I i don't know, maybe it's not for you. But again, nothing's plug and play. It's maybe looks easy on the internet, but I'm telling you, you're gonna have to learn some stuff and put some time in. Wasteboard Untouch. Um, I've even got crap in other videos because my wasteboard has cut marks on it because Ooh, you didn't you didn't set your zero good enough. Um, it's a wasteboard. An entire sheet of three quarter MDF cost thirty five bucks, and if I surface them pieces a few times, I mean, it should last forever. You're gonna cut into your wasteboard. It's what the wasteboard's for. It's not that big a deal. It doesn't doesn't bother me. I'll use it a bunch. I'll get a bunch of cut marks on it because my height was wrong or whatever reason my bit slipped and then I'll just surface it one or two times put new MDF in there and as good as new doesn't bother me takes like an hour it's not that expensive stop being a bully tiling uh, can you tile with this machine yes especially with the 48 inch uh, wide cut diameter it's amazing you can pretty much tile anything I'm gonna do a video on tiling just to show you guys how to do it I just need to figure out a way I want to do it. Um, there's these large pieces of furniture where you cut a bunch of pieces and it makes a cool flowy look. There's a name for it, I can't think of it. I'm probably gonna do something like that and then I'll offer the files to you guys so you can make the same thing, like a chair or a bench. Some sort of large CNC furniture I'm gonna do that will implement tiling just because I think it's cool and I want to try it. I don't think I'd use it a whole lot. Uh, for stuff like that I would probably cut templates but it's a cool feature and for some people it'd probably be useful, so I want to at least show it off and show people how to do it. Accessories and lasers. Um, I don't have an interest in the laser. I think it's pretty expensive to get the laser. Like, it's nice if you don't have a bunch of shop space because it mounts onto the infinity, great. I think it takes quite a while. Um, we're saving for an actual standalone laser, which is why I haven't bought one. But if I had a small shop and I was interested in that, I'd probably get the infinity. JTEC mounty on the spindle deal. Um, other accessories, I touched on the monitor. Um, dust collection, whether you go with the Onefinity dust collection or some other aftermarket deal, get dust collection. Right away, just get the dust collection, it's worth it. Z probe, Z probe's great. If you're new and starting out, it helps you set that zero and that Z depth, but I personally don't use it, but I've been doing this a while, so it's just faster for me to not to use it, but if you're new, I recommend it. What else other accessories are there? Um, there's a few guys on Etsy, Route One and also Rowdy Roman. Uh, they make a bunch of accessories for the Onefinity that I would definitely recommend checking those out. And you're supporting other small shops, purchasing through them. So, I don't know, but dust collection number one. And then anything else that speaks to you, I'd say. So yeah, that is all for this video guys. Thanks for watching. There will be a part two. Again, cable management and uh, setting up the 80 millimeter spindle. So I'm gonna run through all that. Um, that's all I got. Thanks for watching guys. Make sure you follow us on Instagram. Like this video if it helped you out. Hope you all have a wonderful day.